Hello, photography friends, and welcome to our next edition of Enphoto Live Chat. I'm Eugene Nagavieski on behalf of Enphoto Lab, and I'm so excited to introduce to you our guest today, Sujata Satya. Hello, Sujata. How are you today? Hi, Eugene. So good to be talking to you. Absolutely. Now you're coming from uh, London, that's correct, yes? Yes. How is the weather over there today? Oh, it's warm and it's sunny and it's that very seldom day of summer that we get like twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> We're so excited to have Sujata on today. She is uh, the head and the founder of But Natural Photography, Fine Art Portraiture. Uh, and we are so excited to be able to talk with her today about how to master fine art portraiture and also to make it a profitable endeavor. Uh, now, come on in and say hello to us in the audience. Uh, let us know that you're tuning in and where you're tuning in from. Uh, we are more than welcome to field your questions throughout the chat. So do not hesitate to chime in with any question you might have if a question pops up in your head. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Sujata, what do you say? Say about what? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sujata, now I, I came across something that was pretty exciting, and that is a, supposedly you are uh, teaming up with uh, Roberta uh, Benevicini to put on a nice uh, workshop in the U.S. Is, is this true? That's true, actually, Eugene. I mean, uh, it's exciting. Robert and I became very close after both of us, uh, you know, got involved with talking about N Photo, and uh, we both then discussed about how we uh, we wanted to go to the U.S. to run a couple of master classes. So we would be actually traveling in September this year to uh, seven different states: to uh, to Florida, L.A., Texas, Utah. Um, Portland, uh, Virginia, New York. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the states that we are traveling to. And it's going to be a lot of fun. It's it's going to be an action-packed uh, masterclass in each of these states, which uh, both Roberta and I would be conducting together. So, you know, the students will get to learn a bit from her and a bit from me. And, and that's that's an incredible form of learning where, you know, you can go to the same location and learn from two photo photographers how to look at it from a different perspective. Absolutely. I have put a link in the comments section that will direct you to more information about this event, this exciting workshop event that Sujata has just mentioned, seven different cities in the U.S. That's excellent. So any U.S. viewers out there, be sure to check out that link and get yourself signed up for this. And any of you international as well, this is going to be such a wonderful opportunity to really up your game and bolster your photography skills. So once again, the link is up in the comments. Feel free to check that out. Uh, after we're done with our chat, of course, stay tuned now to listen to our chat and go ahead then and check out that link and get signed up for that. Uh, now, Sujata, I want to kind of come to the beginning now. Um, how is it that you you kind of got started with photography and what is it that got you started in, in fine art and fine art photography? Actually, it was a very uh, funny experience, Eugene. I have not got anything to do with photography at all. I was a journalist and a radio presenter back in India, you know. And then I got married, I moved to the UK, and I didn't get a job for the longest time. So uh, it was soon after my daughter was born when I realized I really love taking her photographs. And this is something I have heard so many photographers say that, you know, uh, photography came into their life after their children were born and they found inspiration in taking pictures of their children. Um, mm. So, I mean, that's where I started. I, I just started taking her photographs and posting it on Facebook. And somehow all my friends were like, oh, my God, it's so amazing. And I was like, OK, maybe it is good. I need to start it as a business. So <laughs> it literally was a, on a whim that I started the business because I knew that there was nothing for me to lose in it and uh, once I started it was I started to you know uh, learn self-teach self myself how to take good images and uh, and then fine art photography just happened on its own you know it's just, it's just a, it's, it's a style that I very uh, I got attracted towards and then I created an, its own my own version of it and that's how it happened Okay. And you say it happened on its own. Uh, is it something that you just jumped into immediately or did you kind of experiment with some other styles and then decided on a kind of a fine art style or what is it that really led you into that direction? 
I mean, the only other style I tried, Eugene, was somebody else's style, and and oh. uh, you know that's what happened to me. I, and I think that's what happens to many photographers. I get a lot of messages very often from my students and the community in itself, and you know, people tell me, uh, "Sujata, when I grow up, I want to be you." And I I continuously keep telling them that you know that's what art is about. It's your prof- it's it's your passion. This is something you're totally passionate about. Make it your own. Don't try to be somebody else. So. when i set foot into this industry i obviously got influenced by a lot of photographers who were already present in the industry and had a, had their footprint there and i would look at their work and i'd be like oh my god this is so amazing they make their models wear these fancy dresses and their background is so creamy this is what i want to do this is what i want to become and i tried everything possible to start aping them you know and every time i would try to copy them i was just not able to do that i would still just end up coming up with my own style so people call my style fine art photography but i just call it my style you know so it's it's just something that's coming straight from my heart so the only other person that i tried to be was somebody else but i couldn't i couldn't because i was very honest to my art always okay well we're going to continue to pick sujata's brain and find out some tips for her don't necessarily try to do it exactly that way but maybe it can inspire you to establish your own style but let me ask you that question because it is a concern that a lot of photographers have particularly those starting out but i think at any stage in the game is they fear that they might get too close to somebody else they might replicate somebody's work or they might not seem so original What are some ways that photographers can make sure that they are going down an original path and that they have somebody that they're using as inspiration maybe but that they are not mimicking that too closely? Is there a way that a photographer can make sure that they are staying original with their work? I mean see honestly to to tell you something uh, Eugene there's nothing like originality left in the world anymore because oh. everything that you do definitely there is somebody else in the world who has done that as well it's just that you know uh, you're the one in your part of the world maybe doing it so uh, yes definitely maybe there's nothing called originality but you've got to have your art be your own piece of heart you know uh, the one thing that really worked for me to be like uh, elena shumilova is a russian photographer she's a brilliant brilliant storytelling photographer and there is no denying she's one of my inspirations she's the one who literally you know uh, somehow ignited the passion in me for creating these storytelling images but every time i tried to copy her i couldn't do that simply because i used to make sure that i would write down Uh, i would first of all do model calls to do creative photo shoots the problem mm. photographers have is that they only pay attention to their client work and in their client work they literally you know go and uh, go and follow somebody's tutorial and try and copy paste it all the steps on their own tut- uh, edits now what you need to do to be original is to try and do your own creative photo shoots take at least one day out of the month when you're going to write down on a piece of paper what is it that i want to create what is the kind of work that i like doing write it down write your vision down try and do model calls around it uh, make sure you get the right models and then shoot that shot once you photograph something that is coming from within you that is something that inspires you you will always be original even if you're copying somebody else's editing okay so having this time for creative photography and not getting too caught up in the clients but what what about if people fear that they're going to f- steer too far away from maybe what their client tell them might like is, is that a ra- is that something that should be a concern or do you feel that a uh, clientele will be there even when you follow an organic vision that you have Eugene I love the questions you ask yeah they are so on point thank you so much for asking this so you know that's the fear that's the fear honestly that I had as well you know which is why for the longest time I I used to do a lot of these creative photo shoots in which I would do storytelling photography with my daughter and I would just never post it on my social media pages thinking that what are my clients going to think you know because your audience is also on social media become a uh, very accustomed to seeing a certain kind of work on your page and then if you put oh. something else that's out of the box or that's something that they haven't seen they just don't react and then you when you don't get good l- enough likes then you become under confident so it's such a vicious cycle so it's a very good question you've asked what you can then do is instead of posting it on your business social media handles you should just you know join a lot of uh, uh, facebook photographer groups 
that is something that I did. I joined a lot of photography groups on Facebook and I started posting my creative work, which was not my client work, on those photography groups. When I started getting little amount of validation there or whatever criticism I got that would help me improve my art, once I was confident enough that whatever I'm producing as a creative person is really, really remarkable, that's when I stopped worrying about what my clients will think. And then I started posting it on uh, my social media handles as well. Oh. So you just need that little extra, you know, confidence to be able to post that work. Wow. And for those who don't know, Shijata now boasts over 100,000 followers on both Instagram and Facebook separately. So she has really built herself, even following her own style. So don't fear that having your own way, your own vision is going to limit you from uh, praise and, and clientele. And I want to, you mentioned this, uh, I want you to, I want to ask, sorry, uh, you mentioned this name and I want you to throw it out there again. This Russian photographer, somebody in the audience even asked that question. I want to come back to it. Uh, Sabrina Coleman, thank you for this question. She asked, and as you answered it, is what photographers kind of do you look up to? And, and I want you to mention this name again that you threw out before the Russian photographer. And are there any other names that, that you really looked up to and continue to look up to in, in the photography industry? I definitely love Elena Shumilova. She's a Russian mm -hmm. photographer. She's a Russian uh, she's a storyteller. I mean, her work is just just uh, remarkable. It's it's uh, I've I've never seen work like that. She really puts uh, people in exactly the places they need to be. I mean, it's like she's just capturing normal natural life on the road, and she somehow manages to make it magical. There's another photographer in Bangladesh. I don't know his entire name, but his name is Ashraful. Uh, mm. Ashraful, and he's a beautiful, beautiful photographer. Uh, there's another photographer in Syria whose name is Ahmed Souza. Uh, I mean, I get really inspired by a variety of work. I mean, for example, if you see at Ashraful, the photographer from Bangladesh, his work is completely different from mine. He does street photography and then he does uh, cinema graphs. Uh, but his work has this just inane magic in it that the moment it comes in front of me, I'm just totally smitten. Or or this photographer, Ahmed Souza from uh, 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 Syria, he just literally is capturing uh, the life in Syria right now and how everybody gets impacted. Little children are getting impacted by it. All he's doing is capturing faces. But there's just so much pain, so much narrative in those faces. He doesn't even know how to edit those images. In fact, he's such a poor photographer. He, he doesn't even have the money to enter a photo competition. So even then, he's just remarkable. So, I mean, it's very important to even find your inspirations, to continuously look around social media uh, everywhere you can to see any form of art that can inspire you. Absolutely. And that is a big, important part of perfecting your craft and developing your own is inspiration, too. We're not trying to say don't look to others for inspiration. Simply have that time to practice yourself and you'll watch it evolve into your own vision and into your own form. And uh, that's, I want to come back to the meat of this uh, topic today of how to master fine art prints. So we mentioned that there are these names that you looked up to. There were Facebook groups or, or just photography groups in general. I don't want to put those words in your mouth. Photography groups that you would get involved in and post your work to build this confidence and get the criticism. What are some other ways that people can nurture and bolster this vision that they have and learn how to master this craft, fine art, or whatever their style might be. I mean, besides posting and getting criticism, you mean? Yes. Because we, we talked about shooting, creating creative shooting, looking into some names for inspiration, and you gave a great list of people who you look up to. Uh, you talked about getting involved in these groups and not being afraid of criticism. What are some, is, is there something we're missing that a photographer can do to help to kind of master fine arts or whatever their style may be. I mean, taking training from the people that you are actually really inspired by is the easiest way to really uh, uh, improve your skills, you know. Uh, I mean, even I attended Elena Shomilova's workshop. That was where I actually found my foundation of creating these kind of images. And I find a lot of photographers coming up to me and saying, I can't afford it. But it's actually really investment in your business that you are attending a class uh, by a photographer that totally inspires you. What that does is one, not only does it improve your uh, editing or photography skills, does not only improves your art, but it always also improves your uh, business skills. Because when you go and uh, attend somebody else's masterclass, you're 
sitting in a group of other photographers as well. So you create your own tribe. Building your own community in this industry is so incredibly important. You know, I mean, if I have somebody to sound off my ideas from, uh, every time I feel a bit insecure, I just go to Roberta, the photographer that we were just talking in the beginning about. I just go to Roberta and I share my work with her and I ask her for a, a honest criticism in private. Now, if you don't have that tribe of yours in the photography world, if you're just a lonely photographer sitting in your room, you will not be able to build your skills. So it's very important to go out there, invest in educating yourself and building a tribe of other photographers who can, who you can sound off your ideas from and learn more from. Absolutely. And with that, I will reference back to the link that we posted at the beginning of the chat for the workshops from Sujata and Roberta coming up in the U.S., in the fall so you can learn from perhaps some of your influences as well and be sure to check out Sujata's uh, social media links and her website we have posted those in the uh, description of this chat uh, so you can meet other like-minded photographers and, and get some insight as well as well as don't forget to check out our own platforms on Unphoto as well we have communities full of professional photographers where you can feel free to uh, share your work and get some critiques and criticisms as well do not fear the critiques and criticisms is what I'm hearing. And don't be afraid to share your work. That's how you grow. Yeah. I want to flip it to the other side then and talk about the profitability, kind of the business side of it. Uh, a lot of times people will attribute something like a fine art or the arts in general and think that it it's going to mean living on the streets and not having much to eat and all this kind of stuff. How can photographers now take that vision of fine art or this 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 artistic uh, trade of photography and make sure that it is something that is profitable. My God, I mean, as a fine art photographer, you can make so much money. I don't even understand why people would think that fine art photography is not a profitable profession to be in. Not, I mean, people just skew their, you know, you don't, you cannot skew your business. Uh, 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 what do you say? Uh, 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 the possibility of your business to just taking on clients for newborn photography or family photography you know you've really got to increase your horizons and think what other verticals never put all your eggs in one basket so when i started off doing uh, fine art photography the very first thing that happened to me was the clients uh, were getting confused so they would get photographs of a certain kind and they would have seen some fine art images on my page and they would say, so what's going on, Sujata? Why are we not getting those fine art images? So that's that's the first thing that will happen to you. You know, your clients will come to you asking for those fine art images. Uh, so what you need to then in that case, like what I have done is that I've started creating, I've created two different sets of packages on my website. Mm -hmm. One is the package for a classic photo shoot. What is a classic photo shoot? Where you're just, you know, most of the clients really want to just look at the camera, look pretty, smiling. And, you know, just get that perfect canvas of a very happy family to be put behind their, I don't know, uh, living room wall or, or, or behind their bedroom wall or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On their bedroom wall. So that's called like the classic photography. And I would I would give that uh, give that to them in one of the packages. And the second package is fine art storytelling photography in which you get exactly what you see on my social media handle. So. That fine art photography is way more expensive. The maximum I give in those uh, uh, shoots is say around seven to 10 images maximum. Beyond that, I cannot produce because it's art. Every piece of image is an art. So what that does is then it makes your business profitable simply because you're not alienating the clients who want a cheaper shoot. Mm. Uh, one thing that I realized as a fine art photographer was it is so important to be a good photographer, but it is way more important to be a better business person. If your work is not going out there, if people are not looking at your images and are not admiring it, if they're not reaching back to you to buy some product or some service from you, then, then you're just wasting your time, honestly, because you know, you're far away, you're, you're taking that time away from your family life. So uh, you've got to make sure you promote yourself continuously in different groups on different social media handles, uh, get the word of mouth out there, Create different packages on your website so that the ones who want a cheaper shoot also don't leave your website before buying that uh, shoot. And the ones who want a high end net worth shoot also don't leave your website before buying that uh, package. You know, so have a variety of options available from for uh, audiences from all walks of life. Another thing as a fine art photographer that you can do, which other photographers can't do, is selling prints. I mean, I have, as you know, Eugene, I don't know whether you know or not, but I'm in talks with Enphoto to start selling prints of my work. 
and mm. uh, because i've been getting so much requests so many requests fine art photographers can license their images you can go to licensing websites just post your images there and your work can be licensed you can just be sitting at home and making money off being a fine art photographer Okay, so you threw out a lot of uh, possibilities there, and I'm going to come to the audience for a second. And the reading my mind, I was just going to say that feel free to pop in any questions that you have. I see some coming in. We talked about some inspiration, how to be inspired. We talked about how to get started a little bit, how to find your vision. If you have any questions about that, don't feel free or don't hesitate to ask. Feel free to ask. And we're segueing now into the business of it. And I see some questions in the audience. Uh, one from Vidi, she wants to know, how many pictures do you give in classic photography? In classic photography, as far as I remember, my maximum, the highest package is up to 12 images. Uh, but what I always do is I uh, I tell them, so, my, uh, so even in the classic shoot, I have three different packages. So there's a classic shoot base price, which is 199 British pounds, which hmm. in that you only get my time. You're getting 40 minutes of my life and, and obviously pre-consultation. And all the props and all the dresses that I provide them, they can use all of that. So that's that money is just like pure money they pay me for the shoot. Uh, over that, there are three different packages. In the first package, they can get seven shoot, uh, seven images, and the second ten. And in the final package, they can get twelve images. Um, and between the final and the ten image package, there is like this teeny tiny price difference. So actually, they end up always buying the uh, highest package. And then what I do is I always shoot enough so that I am able to get at least 16 to 17 images out of the shoot so that I can always oversell to my clients. So per image also, they pay me an extra sum. So that's that's how you oversell. Upsell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So overshooting, and we'll, we'll probably come back to the topic of upselling in a minute. Uh, so thank you for that question. One from Crystal wants to know, uh, what does your editing process look like for your fine art images? Oh my God, Crystal, that is such a difficult question to answer. I mean, I can't give you the steps in, <laughs> in yes. conversation, but I can tell you that I do have editing video tutorials and also my Photoshop actions that are available on my website and you can just grab them from there. I mean, they're very, very simple. Okay, so yeah, please check out uh, Sujata's platforms. And again, we have links in the description. We'll be sure to pop them back in the uh, chat as well so you can find them conveniently. Uh, thank you for the question, but that is that is quite a big one. So uh, Sujata has much content on that that you can find on her platforms. Uh, but do, don't hesitate. Keep your questions coming to those in the audience. And I want to come back. Oh, wait, there's one more question of uh, lighting your outdoor images. Jenna wants to know, how do you light your outdoor images? Um, I am a natural light photographer, so I don't use any external light resources to light my outdoor images. What I try to do is make sure that I'm stepping out at the right time of the day to be able to photograph my images. So I try to go closer to sunset. What I do is I make sure that my sun is behind the subject and not facing the subject. So when the sun is behind the subject and the rays of the sun are filtering through any tree leaves or branches before hitting the behind of the uh, subject, of course, then it's very soft, it's very magical, and that in itself makes starts to make your image look like a painting. And you get also a very stunning rim light around your subject that again adds to the magic of the image. So that's the time of the day I go out to shoot and, and uh, don't use any external light resources. I will maybe come back to the editing uh, process, if you don't mind, and just kind of ask you in general, how long might it take you to edit uh, a shoot? Is there some general number you can put or is it always varying depending on the shoot and the client and things like that? It's always varying depending on how much wine I have had more than depending on the <laughs> client <laughs> and also on how much time I'm wasting on social media. But to be honest, I have a very set pattern. I like to finish off with my editing work before my daughter returns from school. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say uh, for my fine art photo shoots, if I have to edit 10 images, it would take me about 30 minutes per image. Mm -hmm. So that would make how much time? 20 to 30 minutes per image. That would be around. That's about that? so five hours. 30, 30, 30, uh, 10 images. Is three, yeah, yeah. 300 minutes. Yeah. Five mm -hmm. hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and again, so you're a natural light photographer and, that, and that's something that you always wanted to do or did you ever try to use kind of a studio or studio lighting and just realize that that wasn't 
your style or how did it come about that you were a natural light photographer? I was actually always a natural light photographer. Being a natural light photographer is actually the in, uh, easiest way to enter the industry, you know, because you don't need mm-hmm. to learn any of these skills that that are you know, that are not naturally available around you. So I started off being a natural light ph- photographer. I really tried hard. I went all the way to Canada to learn from uh, this wonderful uh, maternity photographer. Her name is Ali Peck. Uh, uh, she uh, she uh, has her business name is Glow Portraits. I went to learn uh, um, studio light from her. But simply because I live here in England and I'm not I've not got a studio space and I'm always traveling to teach. I couldn't buy a studio space either so I wasn't able to use my studio lights but I I somehow feel very restricted inside the studio I mean there's only so much you can do okay and it's a nice inspirational a bit as well to those photographers to say that you don't need a studio to be uh making great art and you don't have to worry about all the fancy lighting equipment you can do you can go that way if that's your thing but it doesn't have to be that way either look at Sujata she does it all natural lighting without a studio so that's that's great to know as well and i'm going to come back here now again to how this money can be made from from fine art uh photography print products is a big one and we'll definitely touch on that but you also mentioned licensing images is a way that print photographer sorry fine art photographers can really make money can you just elaborate on that how how that's possible because i think it might be something that a lot that don't don't know about it and uh you, you, you touched on it, you mentioned it, but what, can you explain a little more how a photographer can make that money from the licensing their images? I mean, Eugene, if you look at around uh, all the hospitals, all the commercial buildings, even banks, offices, uh, places that are, uh, you know, new developments that are coming up in those new developments, all the, all the model houses that are created, every structure in this world has a photograph somewhere right at the entrance or in somebody's office or any book cover that you look at has a photograph who is clicking all those pictures right somebody would have already clicked those pictures and someone reached out to them to license that image from them to use it like i uh, because i create a lot of grandparent portraits grandparent and Mm. grandchildren portraits so often i get reached out by churches uh, around the world, you know, and uh, and uh, old age homes in many parts of the world because they want to use my images as part of their marketing or, or uh, you know, on posters or calendars or whatever, you know. So when they reach out to me to use my image, I am selling them a license to use that image, right? So mm-hmm. that is a great way for fine art photographers uh, to earn extra money. Now, if this is something very uh, legal for you as a fine art photographer and your your head is just totally spinning and you're like, oh, my God, I can't even understand how I will license my image or where will I get the licensing agreements from? How will I know how much to charge? Uh, what you need to then just do is look for firms in your own country or in, in, in and around your vicinity to figure out if they are agreeing to license your image like there is a licensing firm called archangel uh who reached out to me and i let them like become the middleman to license my images Mm -hmm. and that way you can just be the creative person you are and leave the work of licensing to somebody else okay i'm going to come back to this idea of being a a natural life photographer i've seen a few questions in the audience pertaining kind of to that and i want to start at the end and go to inga and she says she's an outdoor photographer who constantly has customers worrying about the weather how do you deal with customers who are concerned about weather and if you need to reschedule the shoot what notice do you give your clients see the thing is that already in my contract i mentioned it to them that uh the shoot can be rescheduled around 48 hours prior but considering if there are any uncalled for circumstances where the weather is completely changed and flipped we will have to reschedule the shoot so that is something that i mentioned in my contract itself so that it is very clear to the client that such a circumstance can happen because i'm i'm in london i mean literally eugene while i'm talking to you the sky is just moving so fast it becomes cloudy after a second and i i know it might just end up raining as well so we see uh, four seasons in four minutes here uh, sometimes what mostly what i do is if it is really really cold and windy i i tell them clients are like children you know 
so you have to literally spoon feed them and tell them oh my god it's so cold and windy you know i mean i'm going to create these stunning family portraits of the two of you where i'll wrap you guys around in a blanket and all of you are huddled together and it will look so romantic and it will show your love so even when they are feeling super cold cold they will be like yeah maybe that makes a lot of sense if it's raining i will tell them oh my god can you believe it how romantic the portraits are going to look i'm going to get this uh, transparent umbrella and i'm going to ask you guys to huddle up under it in the rain i can't even imagine how what your friends are going to react after looking at those images and then then they will be like oh yeah it's going to look very romantic so you literally you know uh, sometimes if you are like really desperate and if you are doing way too many shoots in a month and you don't have the time to reschedule the shoot you've got to really really twist the narrative and make it sound like that weather is the best weather to create those kind of images for your clients sometimes you've got to lie a little bit <laughs> Take a negative and and make it a positive, and and you know it's about how you sell it. Um, I think that though that that's not get too hard though. There's a lot of truth to those things that you are saying. There are ways you can make it into a positive. So that that's great advice and great ways to navigate the tricky weather that you guys have over there in England. And hey, if if, if Sujata can do it in England, most people can do it anywhere. England's weather yeah. is quite unpredictable. Another question uh, about the outdoor and working the times from Tara Daniel is she's saying that she sometimes struggles to get families and clients to come to later sessions out of fear of disrupting children's routines. They more prefer mid-afternoon or early afternoon or midday shoot times. What are some things that you might say to them to convince them more for the the sunset time no that's a very good point oh my god i mean that's such a good point because like here also in the uk now we have summers are sunsets at 9:30 pm i can't ever imagine my clients bringing their children 30 minutes before sunset you know at 9 o'clock nobody is going to do that so i do my shoots now at during very harsh sunlit time when it is 5 pm and what you do in those circumstances is you find an outdoor location which is completely in shade you find a patch where there is uh trees i my the way i say trees is so difficult for people to understand you know trees uh, branches of trees mm -hmm. covering your back uh, from you know the entire patch of land with complete mm -hmm. shade so that there is no light in front of the subject and there is no patch of harsh light behind the subject it is all in complete shade and if you can get this massive patch of shade Uh, to go outdoors and do the shoot then you will get even exposure on the faces of your subject and that is good enough to come up with a decent to good photo shoot so you don't need to really worry to ask them to come uh, half an hour before sunset on summer days all right uh that's another great answer to the question keep the questions coming in the audience these are all wonderful questions and i'm going to jump now to to print products And this is a way that photographers, you say, can make money. Fine art photographers, really any at all. What is it about print products? Let's look particularly from a fine art perspective that allows a photographer, a fine art photographer, to make money. Why? Why are print products a good way to go? I mean, that's that's your that's a part of your brand, right? You can't you can't create a piece of art. and then let your client go to like a i don't know snappy snap here in uk or you know just a roadside printer to print that piece of art that's just wrong right so you need to educate your client to know how important getting the right print product is otherwise the image that they have paid so much money for is worth nothing at all so i really put it as part of my marketing and as part of my Uh, write-ups that I sent to my clients and preparation packages that it's very very important for them to actually get the prints from uh, from me and uh, so that they are exactly of the same standard as the work that I'm providing them is. Print products are very very important even for you to upsell yourself. You can charge very less money for your photo shoot and get the client in through the door. Where you make your more higher amount of money through that photo shoot is by actually selling selling your print products. So yeah, it's very important. Is it just a matter of telling them that this is something that matches my brand, or like how can you get it? The convincing part is something a lot of photographers, I think, struggle with. How are some ways that they can help to convince their clientele, who might be on the fence or uncertain of print products, that this is actually what you should be excited about? 
see one of the most important things is obviously to have a lot of samples displayed everywhere around when so that when the client just walks in through the door they can see these incredible stunning sample pieces and you know they are already salivating just to be able to you know be uh, get their work uh, printed in that format that's the beginning of it and the other thing is what i do initially is that i just give them like a you know a, a little bait so i would give them something for a print product for free and then i would give them 100 pounds uh, depending on what package they are going for 50 100 or 150 pounds extra against purchase of any of the wall art so they don't want to let that money go waste right if they've got like that 50 pounds in their pocket just like as a voucher to use against any of my wall arts or any of my print products then they want to spend that money but they are not going to get any of the print products for 50 pounds so they will have to spend that extra money to actually get that product so that's again a very easy way if you are not a person who is very good at selling just give them a little bit of it for free and then uh, price your product in a way that you don't end up losing any money but instead making this basically another upselling tip from Sujat yeah. as well so overshoot is one and give them a voucher that's likely isn't going to be enough for any particular product is another one because they're not going to waste it they're not going to to sit on that when it comes to print products prints wall decor what are the things that really stand out for you what are the things you really lean on and you see that your clientele really enjoy that you offer them Oh my clients love my acrylic prints from N Photo. In fact, I have some of them behind me so I can maybe show them to you. So there's this one. Uh no, this is not the acrylic one. Sorry. I'll show you the acrylic. I love it. It's just uh, can I just flip the camera around? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, that's fine. Mhm. Mm I don't know how to do that. So do you see that that girl right at the back? Yes. Mhm. Mm so that's one of I mean my acrylic work really 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 is remarkable. um uh, uh from n photo and and i love that and that's something my clients love as well it just it just really it's almost like the subject is just walking out of the frame you know so uh, that's something they love also the folio boxes is lo are loved a lot because what happens with the folio boxes is that you can take out all the images and then you can make them sit on that uh, little uh, tray that n photo has started to give it's so stunning so that's again another product that my clients really really love a lot Okay, it looked like you were showing off a stacked acrylic as well with the uh, board behind the acrylic uh, and the standard prints. That's a stacked acrylic print if you would like to check that out on our website. And the wooden ledges to complement the folio boxes, which Sujata is, is mentioning there. And Sujata loves our acrylic prints, and that's great to hear. Perfect timing because we are in the middle of an acrylic campaign where you can get two acrylic samples at seventy five percent off. One as like an album folio box uh, dream book. And then additionally, one as a wall decor item, so you could get a product just like the one that Sujata showed off, as well as an acrylic folio box, and throw in a wooden ledge as well for seventy-five percent off. We will pop a link to that promotion in the chat, so you can easily get it uh, started with that as well. So wall decor acrylic is something that really sells for you. You love the prints, you love the wooden ledges that allow you to display them. Uh, I see a question from from Michael in the audience, so let me get to this. She he asked, "Do you advise your clients what product they should go with, or do you let them choose?" I don't have too many product options to be very honest. I've kept it very limited because I only use the ones that I really totally love. So what that does is that it also limits their choices. But I, yes, I mean a little bit of little bit of tweaking the tweaking of their choice is very very important. I mean they would just otherwise just say we'll just go for a canvas. Now if you I love the canvases that N Photo produces as well, but I can't up I can't increase the price of uh, that product just as much. So I'd rather. try and skew them towards buying an acrylic product so that i can get greater sum out of just one uh, sale that i make so yeah you need to educate them just a little bit okay and now you you mentioned nothing before you start the education process early and that's true and and that's an important part of it isn't it that you you expose it to them early you educate them early on in the process about prints about the advantages of prints and what it is that they're going to get from it what are, what is some way that you might encourage a client to go from a canvas uh to an acrylic or some other product that you might prefer for them to to take advantage of see the good thing is i haven't put i haven't put any uh, canvases on my walls anywhere so one is that they don't even get to see the canvas so I mean the uh, only way I I I would just try and remember I've actually never had this kind of a situation where they wouldn't have gone for the acrylics or the uh, 
uh, other prints that I have here. But if I have to really educate them, what I would do sometimes is I would have I would give them a little bit of a discount, a little discount that doesn't hurt yeah. me that much to be able to make sure that they go up uh, for the acrylic instead of going for a, a wooden uh, uh, for just a plain canvas. Because you know, honestly, even my work wouldn't look good on a canvas. So wow. I don't want them to use a product on which my work will not look good. So that's something that I would tell them. And if they would still not get convinced, I would just give them a tiny additional discount or I would tell them they'll get an extra shoot, uh, milestone shoot after a while if they buy some extra products from me. So it's always if you keep giving them a little bait uh, for the next time, for the next time, for the you know, for something additional, they always end up agreeing with what you are asking them to do. I appreciate what you said at the beginning, though, and that is that you don't really show off the canvas very much because that is a theme that I like to highlight when it comes to the print products. And that is the photographers will sell what they show specifically about the product that they are showing and in general, the product as well. Uh, so showing off print products in general to get people educated on them and aware of them. But then also, as you say, you can select what it is that you really show because it's, it's a reality. It's, it's a it's a marketing truth that what you show off mostly is what's going to be what is sold mostly and what people are drawn to and, and uh, see. So that is a good tip in and of itself is simply don't show as much the things that you don't want people to really be attracted to. Uh, we, we have a question in the, in the uh, audience from Jennifer. How do you go from practicing photography to making money from it? This is kind of the general topic of our chat today. And I wanna say that print products is something that we are talking about right now. And we have mentioned so much already uh, so far in the chat. So this will be recorded uh, and available at a later time. So if you miss something, don't worry, you can go back and, and uh, listen to it later. But we're not done yet. But the key is that print products are something that are really beneficial to help photographers make money. Cause there's a lot that you, you can do with them. You can do a lot of upselling uh, practices like Shujata mentioned of overshooting to have extra stock to show off your clientele to get them excited as well as upselling giving vouchers and and things like this and and you mentioned another one too that i think it shouldn't be overlooked and that is the way you have your packages set up uh remind the remind the audience again the way you have your packages set up and the discrepancy between the, your middle package and your your biggest package yeah i mean so what i do is that for example um, uh I think my smallest package is only five images as far as I remember. I don't think it's, mm. it's even seven images. So when I'm creating so many remarkable images for them, I'm like I said, I always shoot for 16 uh, when I'm actually telling them that the highest package is only 12 images. Now I've shot for 16 images. I've sent them 16 images. There is, uh, and all of them are completely different permutation combinations. Mom with the child, dad with the child, mom and dad with the child, mom and dad together. So, you know, you create 10 different permutation combinations of the uh, family. Uh, poses and then they're like completely at their wits end and they are never able to get the smallest package they can never choose five images so you hook them onto the 10 image package but between the 10 image package and the 12 image package there is just a 50 pound difference which is such a minor difference so they're like forget it yeah let me just pay 50 pounds extra and let me get all the images so uh, so that just always works for me so th that's how you should you know create your packages mm -hmm. Something though that adds up over time as well, of course, if people are always going for that higher option, pricing yourself uh, smartly so that, of course, it's a big gain for you and a big benefit for you. So over time, that will definitely add up. So that's another tip all you photographers out there can take advantage of, especially when utilizing uh, printed products and packages and things like this. Uh, a question that I want to ask to you to kind of put the, the time as well in the frame, printed products selling those is, is usually much easier in person. But of course, everything that has happened in the world over the past year, year and a half, uh, what is something that you kind of can take away from that? Uh, what has happened and to better your business uh, kind of going forward and, and maybe even be prepared for some kind of reality like that going forward? In terms of print products? In terms of being able to still service clientele and in terms of being able to still connect with clients and allow them the experience to, to, to experience print products that they might not be able to if they can't meet in person. I mean, how do you photograph them if you don't meet them in person? No, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying though, okay, what I'm saying is uh, when people were, were not able to, to meet, it might've been harder for some uh, photographers to sell print products. Okay. 
because to do in-person sales for the clientele to be able to to meet or something like this is there something that you have kind of learned throughout this process where it's there's it's effective and so possible to make sales with pr printed products even if you can't meet uh, yeah, in person. Yeah, I mean the easiest way that i i also recalibrated my prices uh during uh, covid and how i did that was that i upped the price just a little bit and i included the print products within the packages itself uh so that i am i am getting paid for my products uh as part of the package they are purchasing because obviously i was not able to call them home for doing in person sales and everything at that time so the easiest way to do this is uh, create your packages in a way where print products are already a part of it and yeah so then you don't really have to do an ips okay and actually this is where i wanted to go to i see a nice question in the audience about advertising to kind of come full circle at the beginning we were talking about getting started and getting your name out there uh you mentioned some photography groups but what are some other ways that you use and we might recommend photographers to put their name out there to put their brand out there to be visible and to be seen there are so many mediums out there i mean the biggest and the most important thing you need to do is something called guest posting what is guest posting is basically there are a lot of websites out there like i think guardian also allows that uh, where you can just go log in and write an article on yourself now one of the best websites that i have used so far is a website called board panda uh, my my pronunciation is so bad eugene i'm sure nobody oh, would it's board, board panda like, yeah right like i'm board board panda uh and it's an amazing website you know i just always really talk about that website uh, that's where i literally got my name out so what i did was i mean i cannot stop emphasizing on the importance of creating your own uh projects come up with a theme come up with a topic uh write it down create a series of images around it the more uh the more hard hitting it is the more sensitive to what are the issues in so so society or in the world that are going on right now if you create a theme or a topic around that and create a series of images around that then anyway you don't need to even worry it will just definitely go viral regardless but if you're creating something that's close to your heart like i started off by creating images of my daughter and my dog and i created a series of those images and then i went on to board panda and i uh, just wrote an article on my own saying that uh, i asked my husband to assist in a photo shoot uh, uh, of my daughter and my dog and it almost led to a divorce now what that uh, did for me was it it got me lots of rolling eyeballs and you know i mean basically it was a clickbait and people started writing very uh, nasty comments under the post saying uh, under the article that i wrote on board panda saying for such stunning images you are writing this kind of a caption or that poor guy tried to help you and you always all, almost wanted to divorce him and blah 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 so what that taught me about marketing was that it is very very important to write a catchy caption line whenever you're writing an article about your own work because even if uh, you've got incredible work but the caption line of the article that you've written is not interesting people are not going to click on that article and the second thing is a little tiny amount of controversy is actually not bad a touch of bad publicity is actually better publicity than good publicity i i don't know if you uh, understand what i mean so yeah i mean writing these articles on your own uh, going to diff uh, joining a lot of different uh, photography competitions it's so important to get your name out there in the community where photography competitions are held as well uh, there are many different websites like view bug uh, 500 pics uh, flickr uh, where you should keep posting your work as well you don't know where in the world your audiences are sitting and from where you are going to get your no next job opportunity I want to go to photography competitions. Uh, you know, we might have a general audience, uh, an audience of a lot of fine art photographers, but uh, across the board, sometimes people are not so sure about photography competitions. What are the benefit of getting involved in some kind of photography competition? And is this something that you recommend? You know, Eugene, can I please tell you honestly, I have been so involved in my work for so many years that I actually never entered a photography competition okay. until... I started getting approached to become jury at competitions and I was like oh my god I feel ashamed that I have never entered a competition before but I only recently entered one competition which was the Tokyo International Film uh, Photography Competition and uh, what I realized was that the kind of opportunities you get if you win that contest your work gets uh, featured in art galleries uh, around the world now that is a 
big blessing like that is such a big plus i i would want that to happen to my work as well right uh, your art gets featured the uh, the jury members of most of the top international competitions are actually uh, you know heads of uh, uh, content at say national geographic or or big photography magazines uh, which are internationally renowned so imagine your work is being uh, judged by that kind of uh, cream crowd you know that kind of jury mm. and that just gets you so much more reach than just being sitting in your own little home and just posting on different groups so that's another kind of audience i would i would definitely recommend people to go out and enter competitions yeah all right and it, but it carries over too i mean for the average client if they click on your website and they see you know a <laughs> winner yeah. of national geographic photo competition you're like wow i want this photographer yeah. so definitely many benefits to doing that you did mention that you entered one in tokyo uh what was that experience like for you did you find it to be something tedious was it something that uh you enjoyed or what was that experience like for you it is it is actually a lot of hard work because every single image that you share you have to write a long narrative about it as to where you came up with the idea and what does that mean to you and it's just a, it's like a lot of work so for every single competition you enter there is a different set of questions that they ask you there is a different set of requirement as well like my kind of work i know some of the competitions would just not even turn around and look at my kind of work because it is uh, because they are looking for sometimes even something that's clicked from an iphone but has way too much uh, reality to it mine is more mine is reality but in a very magical way you know so uh, so you have to actually really see which competition is my work going to fit in and then it is a lot of work because they will always want you to write a story about every single image that you are submitting so but then it's worth it you know if you win it i mean look at the look at the rewards that you get through it so it's totally worth it i want to stay on the topic of visibility and i want to get to uh, you know the big players in visibility th these days and that is social media and how do you go about uh, i guess we'll break it up and we'll say facebook and then you can talk about instagram as you want to as well how do you go about uh, tackling though that platform let's say facebook and uh, what are some some tips that you might be able to give to other photographers of how they can really maximize their time uh, on facebook I think Facebook is the biggest money maker uh, for photographers even when Instagram is out there because you cannot attach your uh, link to your website or any product that you are selling you can't attach the link uh, onto your uh, caption or on your image it just gets lost in translation even if you're trying to sell a service you know but whereas on Facebook you can always add a link to your caption and people can click on it and uh, go to it so I think Facebook is extremely important for your marketing uh, what I realized right in the beginning is that you cannot just hope that i will post my work on my facebook business group and that's it and that's it now i'm hoping everybody to just run and come and look at it and like it because facebook is just literally like a market area you have to literally go to every stop and shop uh, to spread the knowledge about your product so i joined a lot and lot of facebook groups uh, which were mummy and daddy groups when i was trying to sell my photo shoot so i would just every wednesday evening when i knew people were just sitting and chilling at home or a friday evening when i knew they were relaxing in on their phones i would just go and bombard every mummy daddy group with uh, my images you know and always do indirect marketing so i would say something like uh, oh my god i remember this once uh, so I've always wanted to have just one child. Okay, I was very clear on that that I'm not going to go for another child. And so I just I and it's very important in marketing to hook them with like an emotion uh, or ask a question. If you ask a question, people are always very eager to answer that. So I just went on to very many different Facebook groups. This was January, and it was a time when I wasn't getting many shoots. And I wrote saying, you know, I look into the eyes of my daughter, and I feel like she needs a sibling. but i have had such a difficult first pregnancy so much trauma that i don't know whether i can do that again what have been your experiences with being parents of just one child or parents of more than one child just sharing some of my images of that i uh, photographed of my daughter and my dog for your attention only and then people started commenting under that post and it went like crazy that night i was just getting narratives after narratives and at the same time there were a lot of people looking at my images clicking on my personal profile 
seeing that I'm a photographer at But Natural Photography and sending me a message to book me. So I got enough shoots booked off the back of that marketing pitch. So what I realized is that Facebook is just not about your business page, but it is about making a dedicated effort once a week at least to go and post your work on different uh, groups to get visibility. And groups that are related to uh, the type of photography that you do. So earlier in the chat, you were talking about, we were talking about photography groups, but it also benefits, uh, as you just mentioned, groups that you generally service. So it was like a mommy dad, it was like a mommy group. It wasn't necessarily a pro profession, professional photographer group, but it was that target audience that you wanted. So don't limit yourself only to professional photographer groups, but think to yourself where your target audience is hanging out on Facebook and find those groups and do something like Sujata said. That's, that's really great. Uh, as you said, straddle that line of uh, controversy to get the topic going and put in a nice picture of your work and watch watch the discussion go. So that's a great. And you were mentioning that you, you for you, Facebook is more beneficial than Instagram, which uh, is interesting to hear because you generally hear from photographers the, the opposite, but you did list the reasons why. So Facebook might be uh, a good place uh, to start uh, to increase your visibility uh, for your photography studio. Uh, so thank you for that, Sujata. I'm going to give kind of a last call in the audience if anybody has any questions for Sujata while we close it up here. Anything about marketing or uh, inspiration or or how to get started and things like this. I wanted to uh, – there's a question from Michael Vines. Are you currently offering training to professional photographers? What are your plans? Now, uh, Michael, we have mentioned this a few times, but please, Sujata, let the audience know again what your plans are for training uh, professional photographers. So I have a lot of uh, educational uh, video editing, video tutorials and, and my Photoshop actions and video tutorials on how to understand natural light uh, available on my website. So you can go there and get them. I am also going to be making a tour to the U.S. with uh, another wonderful photographer and an in-photo ambassador, uh, Roberta. Um, and she and I are going to the U.S. in September 2021 uh, to seven different states to run a host of uh, photography masterclasses. You can get all the information on my website again. So, yeah, that would be wonderful if you could join in. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in for today. We're running a bit out of time, so we're going to end it there. I do want to remind everybody about our 75% off uh, acrylic promotion going on right now where you can get two acrylic samples for 75 percent off be sure to click on the link in the chat to get going with that and thank you so much for joining us today shujata and thank you everyone in the audience for for tuning in thank you all right everybody thank you i'm regina with shujata saying goodbye now take care <laughs>